This is the intro video for the Thin Lenses experiment. You've got this device on your desk called an optical bench, and it's got brackets on it that can slide around. They can also be locked in place via a screw on the back. You've also been given various screens and lenses, and they will fit into these brackets so that you can move them up and down the optical bench. So for example, one very common thing you might do is have a light source at the end of the track here locked in place and then what's called an object screen with a little pair of uh, arrows cut into it that sits right in front of it and then you would put your lens some distance away from the object and then your image screen again some distance away from the lens so that's a pretty typical setup you might see so in this case I've got a converging lens here and if I turn on my light source it illuminates these arrows, the light goes through the lens and then I'll be able to capture an image on the screen here. This screen also has little lines on a centimeter scale on it so that allows you to measure the size of your images a little more easily. So now I want to give you a little tip on viewing the image. So this is a typical setup and we're supposed to have a nice sharp image on that screen. You don't see much, do you? That's because the perfect place to put your face in order to view the image is looking straight back towards the light bulb. So if you put your face down on the same level as the screen, looking straight back at the light bulb, then the image becomes really nice and bright. And you view it from the back, notice, not from the front. And if you go to even a slight angle, suddenly it's really hard to see. So that's what I recommend you do. But if you're having trouble seeing the image anyway, Another thing that you can do is to remove this screen entirely and replace it with a piece of white card and then you can view the image from the front. So here's another tip for getting things exactly in focus. So right now I've got my image in focus. If I move it a little bit off from focus, however, not only does it get fuzzy, but the edges kind of get a red halo around them. So it's just slightly reddish colored. If I go back to focused and then go past it in the other direction, again everything gets fuzzy and the edges get kind of a blue halo now. So right now I've got a bluish colored halo around the edges. If I go back to the other side I get a slightly reddish colored halo. That effect is called chromatic aberration and it's due to the fact that different wavelengths of light will refract different amounts when they're going through glass. When you do the prism spectroscopy lab you're actually going to study this effect. So it's sometimes useful when you're trying to get something exactly in focus to not only make it look sharp, but also try and minimize those colored halos. So if you see a bit of a blue or a reddish halo, keep moving because you're not quite at the right location yet. Now when it comes to thin lenses, everything gets measured relative to the lens. So for example, this is your object and your object distance is defined as being from the lens to the object. And likewise, your image distance will be defined as being from the lens to the focused image. So that's your image distance. Now in your notebook you should always write down raw data not calculated values. And these actually are calculated values because the only thing we're going to be recording is their positions to begin with. So each of these little brackets has a little arrow that points onto the numbered scale and you can take its position down based on where the arrow is located. So if you write down the position of the object, the position of the lens, and the position of the image, then to get your image distance, it would be one minus the other to get the image distance, and again, one minus the other to get the object distance. So they are calculated values. So in this part of the experiment, you're going to take your converging lens, which is the one that magnifies images, and you're going to get a rough focal length for it. So the trick we're going to use in order to get the focal length of this is that we know that if light is coming in towards the lens from a distant object, the light rays are basically coming in parallel and the image that you form with that lens is going to form at the focal length. So what we're going to do is you should go and find an outside window and a handy wall and you get an image of the most distant objects you can see focused on the wall. So the horizon or some clouds would be perfect. And once you've got it focused, then you go and you measure the distance between the wall and the center of your lens when the most distant objects are in focus. And that would be your approximate focal length for this lens. 
In the next part, you're going to be verifying equation 2 in your lab manual, which governs how much a thin lens magnifies an image. You don't need to do any uncertainty calculations, but you do want to take enough measurements to mathematically verify that equation 2 is valid. So to begin with, you should set up your bench like this, with the light source and the object at one end of the track and locked in place, and your image screen sort of in the middle of the track. Then you want to move your converging lens to a location where you see a nice sharp image formed on your screen. And you won't be able to see this very well, but that gives me a nice sharp image. Specifically, I'm seeing this nice sharp image, although it is still a little bit wonky looking on the camera. Those small lines on the screen are two millimeters apart, so you could very easily measure how high this was. Then you want to take all the measurements that are going to be necessary to verify equation two. So you're going to need the height of the object, so the height of these arrows over here, and also the height of the image over here. You're also going to want your image distance and your object distance. So like I said before, that means you want to record these three positions and then do the calculations to get those values. And then using those four things, the two heights and the two distances, you should be able to confirm mathematically that equation two appears to be valid. Then you're going to move your lens because there's actually a second position where you can get an image formed on your screen. So you would move your lens down the track until you see a second image in sharp focus. And again, you won't be able to see this very well, but I've now got a second image formed on my screen. And it looks like this. Note that you'd have to use a ruler to measure this one because it's so large that it's actually fallen off the ends of the scale. So again, you want to take all the measurements necessary to confirm equation two. So this height, the height of the new image, the new object distance, and the new image distance. So the three position in order to get your two distances. So again, you confirm equation two, and then they say, what is the relationship between the magnification you found in this configuration and the one you found in this configuration? There is a mathematical relationship between them. Figure that out. In the next part of the experiment, they want you to take either a strip of paper or your finger and block off the top third of the object and see what it does to the image, the bottom third, see what it does to the image, and the middle, and see what it does to the image, and then explain what's happening. For this part of the experiment, you're going to need to use the entire length of the track. You're going to be making a graph that verifies the thin lens equation. And specifically, you're going to use that graph to determine the focal length of your converging lens. Now, generally speaking, with a graph, you want to span the largest possible range of data that you can. It'll give you a more accurate graph and therefore more accurate values. So the independent variable in this part of the experiment is going to be the position of the lens. And so that's the thing that we want to vary as much as possible. We want it to be as close to the object as possible and also as far away. So the first thing you want to do is actually figure out what the two extreme values are. How far in either direction can you go and still get a focused image? Now you'll remember from the previous part of the experiment that for any screen position, there's usually two locations where you can get a focused image. So what I recommend you do to get your two extreme values is put the screen right on the end of the track, just about ready to fall off, and then go and find the position of the lens closest to the object that gives you an in-focus image. That'll be one of your values. And then scoot down to the other end of the track and get an in-focus value down here as well. And those will be your two extreme values. So you need six to eight data points in order to get a good graph. So that was one, this is two, and you need four to six in between. So you've got the two outside ones. For the rest of them, you'll set the lens position to wherever you want it to be and then you'll move the screen around in order to get a nice sharp image. So it's only for getting the two extreme ones where I recommend you sit the screen right at the end of the track. So for all your six to eight data points, you're going to have the object position, which is not going to change, a lens position, and an image position. And then you'll calculate your image distance and your object distance for each position of the lens. And you're going to make your graph using that information and if you're wondering how you go about extracting your focal length from your graph, read over this paragraph right underneath equation one, because it steps you through how to get that. 
and in this part of the experiment, for each lens position, they also want you to record the orientation of the image, that is to say whether it's inverted or upright, and also the relative size of the image, so is it bigger or smaller than the original object was. In part B, we're going to study a diverging lens, and this is a little bit tricky because a diverging lens usually creates a virtual image. So what's the difference between a real image and a virtual image? A real image is one that you can cast on the wall or on a screen. So a movie projected on the screen would be an example of a real image. So if you can shine it on the wall, it's a real image. A virtual image, on the other hand, is one where you have to look through the lens in order to see the image. So right now you're seeing a virtual image of the Teletubby. And because this is a diverging lens, he looks farther away than he actually is. Another very common example of a virtual image is if you wear glasses, you're looking at a virtual image of the world because you had to look through the lenses in order to see it. So now we come to the problem of measuring the focal length of our diverging lens, and that is if I have to look through the lens in order to see the image over here somewhere, how do I measure how far away that is? Because I still need my object distance and my image distance. How am I going to measure these if I have to look through the lens? Well, we're not going to. We're going to play a trick on nature. Instead of using a real object like this Teletubby, we're going to use the image cast by a different lens as our object. So this is the converging lens from part A. And if I turn on my light source, over here I've got an in-focus image that's just floating in air. We're going to use that image as the object for the diverging lens. So we're going to stick the diverging lens here and see how far away it shifts the image. So just to demonstrate, if I put my screen right here, you won't be able to see this, but I have a nice in-sharp focus image of the object on my screen. And then, when I stick the diverging lens in between the two, that causes this image to go out of focus because it's now going to be focused over here somewhere. So I can slide the bracket down the track until I see a nice sharp image. And again, unfortunately, you can't see that but now I've got the image focused again. So how do I get my object and image distances? Well, remove this guy again, put this back in focus, put him back. So this is where you started. This was where the initial lens was focusing the image. That means measuring from this screen to the diverging lens is your object distance. So this is the object distance from where the image was when this was not here relative to the lens which is here now. So you would take these two positions, that gives you your object distance, and then your image distance would be after you move this down the track to where it's focused. And again, measure it relative to the diverging lens. That's going to be your image distance. So once you've gotten your data for the image distance and the object distance of your diverging lens, you're going to plug that into the thin lens equation and calculate the focal length of this lens directly. So we're not going to make a graph of this one. And when you're doing this calculation, be careful of the sign convention. Remember that a diverging lens is supposed to have a negative focal length. So if your calculations don't give you a negative number, you've made an error somewhere. And scrolling down to the next page here, they do explain the sign conventions used in the thin lens equation. So you get your focal length, and then they want you to do two more trials, where you put the diverging lens in a different location. So for example, you might insert it here or here, and you get data for that as well. The reason why we're only doing three is because obviously there's not much space in here to actually put the diverging lens in to various locations. So you do it three times in total, you get three different focal lengths for the diverging lens based on the thin lens equation, and then you'll average them together, and that'll be what you report. So at this point you've finished your experiment and you'll want to write up your report. When you write your discussion section, I strongly recommend that you flip back to the objective and reread it before you start doing your analysis. And I recommend you do that for every experiment because the procedure is always left intentionally a little bit vague and it's really easy to miss an important part of the analysis if you don't go back to the objective and reread it. So for this and every experiment, I recommend when you start to analyze things for your discussion, flip back to the objective, reread it, and make sure that in your analysis you've addressed all of those objectives for the experiment.